Amen. You may take your seats, turn on your Bibles, take them out, however you read Scripture these days. So it will be on the screen behind me as well, so if you don't have one, don't worry about it. We're ready for that as well. We're going to be in Judges this morning. Early part of the New Testament, Judges chapter 6. But this guy is a guy called David Garrett. And he lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. And as you can tell by the uh, thing on his t-shirt, he runs a ministry called One Seven. Him and uh, both he and his wife, MC, uh, short for Mary Catherine. I don't know why she's called MC, but maybe she's some sort of DJ. And they lead an inner city youth project for young kids, broken kids from broken families, kids who are living on the streets, who have nowhere to turn to, literally kids as young as 11 who are out on the streets and just trying to survive. And amazing that he set up a ministry like this because he would say in his own story, he grew up in a great family. He had a great life. His father was a judge. They didn't really want for anything. They had a nice house with a white picket fence, literally just as you'd see on the movies. Everything on the outside seemed great. But he said something was wrong. Something was missing in his life. He said, I never fit in. He said, I just didn't seem to fit into anything. I didn't seem to fit in my family. I didn't seem to fit with friends. I didn't fit at school. And he said that led to a very destructive life. It ended up being a life of drugs, of taking drugs and then selling drugs. And with his dad being a judge, he used his kind of influence and power to get out of trouble many, many times. But he said there came a point in his life where his things fell apart. His dad cheated on his mum. He had an affair and then he eventually left the family. He said it was one of the darkest times of his life. And he said by the age of 21, he checked himself into a drug rehab center. Just 21 years old, already in drug rehab. And he said it wasn't shortly after that that his dad died. But he said 24 hours before his dad died, he changed his will. And he said he left every penny of the family's money to another woman and left his own family penniless to struggle on their own. And he said, I remember by age 23, he said, I was sat in my condo. He said, I was just on a chair, rocking backwards and forwards. And he said, balanced on my knee was a sawn off shotgun, a gun that I used to carry around when I was selling drugs. And he said, I was just broken inside. He said, I was sobbing my heart out, wondering, why am I here? What is the point of this life? Would anybody notice if I was gone? Does anybody care? And he said, as he sat there crying, he said, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, because he wasn't thinking about God at all, he said, everything I'd ever heard about God or known about God started spinning through my head. He said, I couldn't turn it off. It just kept coming. And he said, eventually, I, I slid off the chair and onto my knees. He said, the gun slid across the floor. And he said, I ended up with my arms raised high. And he said, God, if you're able to save me, I'll never go back. I'll never go back. And he said, he ended up just falling asleep. But he said he woke up the next morning and he knew something was different. He said it was like a light switch that had been flicked on in a dark room. He said, I couldn't describe how I felt, but he said, I knew I was different. Something had changed. And he said, I, he said, I managed to pick up a Bible and he said, I opened it and, and I started reading Jeremiah. So I've never read Jeremiah, an Old Testament prophet. And he said, I started reading at the beginning about how God called Jeremiah to a specific purpose to do something specific for him. And Jeremiah kept complaining, saying, I'm too young, I can't do this, I can't speak. You need to find somebody else, God. But he said, God said to Jeremiah, I've created you for this. This is why you were made, for this purpose. 
And he said, it was right then and there, he said, I knew that God created me for a purpose. I knew that I was made for something different. I wasn't just running through life aimlessly trying to have fun. He said, I was made for the purposes of God. And so we're going to continue our series this week. We're made for greatness. It's the extraordinary life. I don't know about you, but there's many people on this planet who want to live an extraordinary, extraordinary life. Nobody really wakes up on a morning and says, I just want to be ordinary. There's something inside of us that yearns for greatness, to do something worthwhile with our life. We've heard about that over the last weeks as Pastor Dan's been preaching. Because it's something that God built into us. We're hardwired for greatness. We're meant to be great. We're meant to do great things. And David Garrett now leads a successful ministry. Leading young people to know the love of God. To know that God created them for a purpose. And I know you're all wildly curious about this piece of string. And I'm going to leave, no, I'm not going to leave you curious. I'm going to tell you what it's about. But you need to use your imagination. Do you remember? You used to have one of those when you were a child. I know some of you still are. But we're going to use our imagination. Imagine that this piece of string goes on forever both ways. It doesn't stop at the walls. It goes through the walls and it goes on and on and on. It never stops. It just keeps going in both directions. Where it's come from and where it's going to never ends. And this line represents eternity. Because we live in eternity. We might live in a space and time now. We may be limited by space and time, but we live in eternity. That in 2015 is our point on the scale of eternity. And this is your life. See that? That's your life. Impressive, isn't it? And what we're going to do, we're going to put your life right in the middle of eternity. 2015. Now you may only be 11, 12. You might be 73, I don't know. But for me, my point in eternity, I'm 47 years old. I started somewhere. But that whole scratch on that line there represents your entire life. All that you've lived so far and all that you will live is in that bit of thread. It's a little bit disconcerting. Is it not that that is as much as we get? And we might live to the grand old age of a hundred. Wow. Hundred years old. It's pretty impressive. Most of us probably won't get that far. If we get to 80, 85, we'd say, man, they lived a good life. They had a good innings, so to speak, as we'd say in cricket English. They've had a good innings before they kicked the bucket. But for, sure, for absolutely certain, every one, of us ha- every one of us has a beginning and an end to our life, and it's a tiny portion of eternity. But the trouble is, many of us are after trying to make this about us and make it significant, and it's impossible. We can't do it. It says here, our life can only mean something when it is lived for the greatness of God. When we try and make this tiny little scratch on the immense line of eternity about us, we live a futile life. Because anything in and of ourselves is not going to make a huge amount of difference. Some people have, but it's amazing. And I was thinking um, about people who have invented drugs, penicillin. You know, done amazing things. And it's amazing how many of these people who seem to make a small scratch on eternity were those who believed in God. They had a relationship with God and everything they did was for a greater purpose. And so we can have this tiny little mark on life and it can begin and it can end there and people might know we never existed. Like David Garrett who could have ended at 23 years old and done nothing, had no effect at all. And now here he is, his life is having a ripple effect through the years to come. 
because he's now investing in the lives of young people who will invest in the lives of others, who will invest in the lives of others. Because all the people on his staff are people who were affected by him reaching out to them. Not people who've come in from the outside. They've all seen what God can do with a life and they want to be involved in it now. And that's what God is calling us to do. God wants to break into our lives this morning. Are you ready for that? Well, there's about three people more than there was in the first service. I'm pleased that you came ready for God to meet you this morning. Are you ready for God to break into your life this morning? Good. Then we've got something to work with. So, we're going to get into the scripture. Pastor Dan preached on Esther last week, and it was an awesome service. If you haven't uh, listened to it or watched it, do so this week. An awesome message. Don't do it now, because I'm speaking, and that would be very rude. But we're going to talk about another character, a character called Gideon. If you haven't already seen it in your Bibles, chapters 6, 7, and 8 of Judges are about Gideon. And I'm in Joshua, so that's not going to help. There we go. Gideon. Many, I mean thousands of sermons preached on Gideon. You know, he's not one of those obscure uh, characters in the Bible because his story is pretty impressive, to be honest. And I'm not going to read all of this. I'm not going to read through it now because it's, it's quite a long thing, but I would really encourage you to read these three chapters and see God at work. And one of the things that was amazing about Pastor Dan's message last week in Esther is that God's name is never mentioned at all in the book of Esther. Not once is his name even mentioned. And yet... God is riddled throughout the story of Esther. He's engineering the circumstances and everything that happens is because it's about God. It's not even about Esther. It's not about the Jews. It's not about Israel. It's about God and his greatness. And it's exactly the same in Gideon's life, except his story is completely riddled with the mention of God right from the very beginning. Because it says in the first verse, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so just to set the scene of where we're at, we're in the book of Judges. It's 21 chapters long. And we're only at chapter 6. But the book of Judges spans about 300, 350 years. This, this book spans about that amount of time uh, in Israel's history. And at chapter 6, they have already, there's seven relapses, basically, in Judges, where they kind of, they love the Lord, and then they go back to idol worship. They love God, and then they go back to idol worship. And this goes on and on through the book of Judges. Seven times it records these periods where they love God, and then go back to idol worship. And this is the fourth out of those seven times. And we're only at chapter 6, you know, in, in, this, in this period of the Judges where God raises up somebody to rescue Israel from themselves, basically, because they keep going the wrong way and doing the wrong things. But God is gracious. And so the first six verses tells us a little, about, little bit about what's going on. The Midianites are oppressing Israel. Israel are now in the promised land. They've wandered around the desert for 40 years. They've taken the land. They're in the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, and they're still being attacked. They're still being oppressed. And this has been going on now for seven years. Seven years the Midianites have been oppressing Israel. And they're coming in, they're raiding, they're stealing, they're destroying things. And the Israelites have literally run to the hills. They've taken to the hills. They're hiding in caves and shelters to get away from the Midianites, rescuing what little they can of the crops that they have worked so hard for. And yet, God is still involved. And in verse 6, it says, Midian, was so impoverished, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. And, and, I, and I looked up that, that word, impoverished, because I thought, that's a great word. We don't, it's not a word that we use very often. And it says that it made them so poor, so weak, so desperate, so without hope. This is the state that Israel is in at the moment and I wonder how many times God leaves us to our own devices till we get to that point where we're so impoverished we're so weak we're so desperate we've tried everything that we can think of to sort ourselves out and then we get to the point like Israel did where they cried out to God they cried out to God for help verse 7 
of chapter 6 is, when the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet. And, 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 and I think the amazing thing that struck me when I read this was that actually Midian, the, the Israelites aren't even crying out in repentance. They haven't even got to the point yet where they realize that this oppression is because of how they have been. They don't even realize that it's because of all the idol worship that's been going on for the last seven years. In fact, Gideon's father, Joash, is the one that's in charge of Baal's altar. It's his family that actually looks after the altar to false gods. And yet God, before he comes to rescue them, he sends a prophet just to remind them of exactly what is going on. And he says to them, the reason you're in this place is because of your sin. I sent you, um, I've sent you deliverance so many times. I brought you out of Egypt. In verses 8 to 10, he tells them what he's done for them. And he says in verse 10, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. You've done your own thing. You've gone back again to worshipping false gods, the gods I told you not to, the gods who will ruin your life because I am the only God. And so this is kind of Gideon's point in life. This is Gideon now on his little line, his little scratch on eternity. And God is going to break into Gideon's life just like he wants to break into your life this morning. And so we get to Gideon in verse 11. It says, the angel of the Lord. Just stop there a minute. That's actually God. God hasn't sent an angel. When we talk about the angel of the Lord, it's a theophany. It's God appearing himself in the form of a man. So this is God has come down. The angel of the Lord came down and sat under the oak in Oprah. The place, not the celebrity. It's just she gets everywhere. That belonged to Joash, the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now we need to just imagine this. I mean, I, I love movies and I, and I like watching movies. And I kind of visualize these things. I was listening to the story of Esther last week and, and it has been made into many, several versions of movies. And Gideon is too. But just imagine, this is the opening scene. Gideon. Because in verse 12, it says, When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. He's not meant to sound like Darth Vader or anything. It's just, it's just one of those theatrical voices. And the curtain opens. And what do you expect to see? Like a man from Sparta, really, don't you? You know, bronze armor, sword in hand, shield, covered in blood, ready for battle. <laughs> Mighty warrior. And what happens? The curtains open, and there's Gideon hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat with a stick. Mighty warrior? Seriously? It's not my image of a mighty warrior. I've seen, I've seen 300. I know what a warrior looks like, and that is not a warrior. It's a scared little farmer. And he's hiding in a wine press. You don't beat and thresh wheat in a wine press. I'm not a farmer, but I know that's not how you do it, because wine presses, as far as I know, are for grapes to produce wine. And an, and, an, and an ancient wine press would be a hole dug in the ground, often in a rock, cut out of a rock somewhere, somewhere where it wouldn't be seen. But that is where Gideon is, and he's threshing wheat, beating it with a stick. Whereas the threshing floor would normally be a wide open space where lots of wind could pick up the chaff as they're beating it and blow it away so they're just left with the wheat. But this is Gideon, mighty warrior. Seriously. But it is amazing what God sees compared to what we think about ourselves. So here's Gideon. And even as Gideon is in his hiding place right now, 
I just wonder, just a question came to me when I was preparing this message. Where are you hiding this morning? What are you hiding from? Are you afraid to go public with your faith? Are you afraid to speak out on something that is unrighteous? Maybe you think that God has just abandoned you because when we get to verse 13, straight after this, it says, Gideon replied, but sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our fathers told us about? When he brought them out of Egypt. Where, where's that God? I don't know. I don't, I don't see him around anywhere. I've heard the stories, but it's not been happening in my lifetime. Gideon is literally just trying to survive. He's not even living, really. He's just surviving every day, trying to get what little bit he can to make it through that day. And yet God comes to him, mighty warrior. It's amazing that Gideon's name actually means hacker. Not like computer hacker, like somebody who hacks things to pieces. Breaks into pieces is what his name means. Which sounds a little bit more like a mighty warrior than a farmer who's just threshing a bit of wheat with a stick. But what we think of ourselves and what God sees can be a huge difference. And is usually a huge difference because God sees more in us than we can ever possibly think of ourselves. And in Ephesians 3 verse 20 it says this, now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work in us. That's the key to this. That's the key to this whole story. That's the key to eternity. That's the key to your life and my life this morning. Because whatever God is going to do with this tiny little scratch is about him. It's not about us. It's not about the things that we've got in us. It's the things that God is going to put in us through his mighty power at work within us that same God who is able to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think I actually prefer the NIV version it says what we can imagine you know, back to that imagination what can you imagine what can you imagine that God is able to do hopefully big things but I wonder if we really believe that God wants to do those big things through you and me. Oh, well, that would be great for Billy Graham. You know, he's done great things for God. Fantastic. You know, Bill Hybels, you know, mega church, great. It's great that God called him to do great things. But in my Bible, it doesn't differentiate. There's no names listed. It just means that anybody who's willing to say yes that if we're willing to say yes to God, then he will come in and break into our lives and do something. And, and you know what? Gideon is not a great man of faith either. He's not, a, he's not a mighty warrior and he's not even great at faith. He's not actually very good at being kind of, oh yes, God, okay, let's do it. Time and time again through chapter six and to, almost to chapter seven. He's asking for signs and confirmations and, oh, I'm really still not sure. Can you just tell me again if this is really right? He needs reassurance because at this point in his life, why on earth would God want to use me? Why on earth would God want to use me? And it reminds me of a story of a, of a little five-year-old, Johnny. And he's in the kitchen with his mom and she's cooking supper and she says, Johnny, I want you to go to the pantry and get, get me that can of tomato soup. I need it for supper. And Johnny's a bit nervous. He's like, well, I don't want to do that, mom. That pantry's pretty dark and scary. No, Johnny, I need it for supper. Just, just go and get the can. It's fine. There's nothing in there. And Johnny's like, well, I, I don't want to do that. I really don't want to do that. And mom's like, Johnny, go and get me the can of tomato soup. So he kind of hesitantly walks over to the pantry and opens the door and looks inside. Oh, it's pretty dark in there. Pretty scary. Starts to back away from the door. I'm like, oh. And all of a sudden, a thought comes to him. And he walks up back to the door. Kind of peeks around the door again. He says, Jesus, if you're in there, can you hand me that can of soup? 
We need reassurance sometimes. Because some of the things that, I tell you what, actually not some of the things, everything that God will call us to will be impossible in our own strength. Because if it's possible, God doesn't even need to turn up. If we can do it in our own strength, it doesn't mean that God doesn't even need to be there. But God starts with the impossible and works from there. Because it's his power at work within us that is going to make it the way that we need to be. And I, and I remember, I've been listening to a few sermons this week, and some by uh, Stephen Furtick, the pastor at Elevation Church. We sing some of their songs. And he says this one phrase, and it really kind of, it made me laugh and it made me cringe a little bit. He said, God's looking for people who are dumb enough to say yes to his outrageous plans. Are you dumb enough to say yes to God this morning? Sounds a little bit offensive. But sometimes just God wants us to be at that point where we just say, I haven't got a clue what's going to happen, but I'm in. If you're in it, God, I'm in it. I want everything that you've got and more. But I, just, I can just see Gideon at this point, mighty warrior. And, and, and the amazing thing in this next verse, Gideon's kind of already shown his, his kind of, I have no idea what you're doing. And he's, he's told God, I'm too weak. I'm the least in my family. But God says to him, go in the strength you have and save Israel. And I kind of bring this into modern life. I just think, you know, Gideon's there and he's got his cell phone. He takes his cell phone out and he's texting his friend. You'll never believe what's happening to me at the moment. This guy's just turned about nowhere because at this point he doesn't know it's God. He just thinks it's a man. You know, we'll find out later in the story that he realizes it's God. And he's texting away and he said, you know, this guy says, mighty warrior. You know, I don't know what he's looking at, but it's not me. And then he says, go in the strength you have and save Israel. Dot, dot, dot. Lol. <laughs> Seriously, this tiny, scared little farmer beating wheat in a wine press. Go in the strength you have and save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. <laughs> Good one. You've lost the plot. But Gideon keeps going. And then eventually he makes this offering and he brings it back to the, the guest, this man, whoever he is. And the man says, put it on a rock. And the man, the God, takes the staff that's in his hand and he puts it on the rock and fire shoots out the rock. That's pretty impressive. Fire shoots out the rock. Have you ever seen that happen? No, because it doesn't happen very often. Usually only when God's involved. Consumes the whole offering. The light goes on. Gideon just realizes he's seen God face to face and thinks, I'm dead. I'm a dead man. I've seen God. It's, I'm done. And God quickly reassures him and says, no, don't worry, Gideon, you're not going to die. Because you've got a purpose. You have a purpose that you have yet to fulfill. And God is in the business of putting us back together. God is in the business of putting us back together. I love this passage in Hebrews 13. I pray this over myself many times and I encourage you to pray the word of God over you. This is Hebrews 13 verses 20 and 21. It says, May God, who puts all things together, makes all things whole, who made a lasting mark through the sacrifice of Jesus, the sacrifice of blood that sealed the eternal covenant, who led Jesus, our great shepherd, up and alive from the dead. May that God now put you together. Now put you together and provide you with everything you need to please him and make you into what gives him the most pleasure. By the means of the sacrifice of Jesus the Messiah, all glory to Jesus forever and always, or yes, or yes, or yes. That's a great verse. Pray that over yourselves, that God will put you together and make you into what pleases him, what brings him pleasure. What a scripture to pray over our lives because God is in the business of putting us back together. We try to do it ourselves and I guarantee that we will fail time and time again because it's his power at work in us that is going to transform us. It's his power that at work in us that's going to make a difference in our lives and the lives of those around us. God is going to break in with his power and put us together, make us right so that we can bring honor to him. 
So here's Gideon. He's asked for the fleece several times. God's even shown him that he's going to defeat the Midianites through the mouths of the Midianites themselves. He gives one of the Midianites a dream and Gideon overhears it. The Midianites know that almost the battle is in Gideon's hand and yet Gideon's still wavering a little bit. But God calls him and says, right, get an army together, it's time. So, I mean, I still find this a little bit amazing that this little farmer has to call an army together. He's not a military man at all. But for, for, for the reason that God's involved, Gideon calls an army together and masses 32,000 men. That's pretty impressive. Could you get 32,000 men to come and fight with you? I couldn't. Why don't we look if I could get 20? 32,000 men rally around Gideon and say, we're in for the fight. And, you know, God's looking there and he's like, hey, Gideon, you know, great army, but it's too big. It's what? I thought numbers in an army were supposed to be good. Big numbers, big army, good chances of winning. Especially when we realize that the Midianites had 135,000 in their army. So Gideon's doing his maths. Take away that. Wow, that's four to one. It's not over the odds if you're Sparta, but a couple of farmers, you know, can we beat four men each? I don't know, it's pretty difficult odds, but maybe. And then God says, you know what, actually Gideon, that's, that's still not good enough. I think we need to take it down a little bit more. It's like, oh, okay. I suppose we could maybe manage with a few less. I want you to get rid of all the scaredy cats. Tell them to just go home. Anybody who's kind of knocking at the knees, you know, really doesn't want to be here, would rather not fight in a battle against the Midianites. Tell them to go home. Oh, okay. Well, if you're scared, you can go home. He loses 22,000 men. 22,000 men. What? Well, 10,000. Well, okay, well. Let's do the maths. Well, that's 13 and a half to one. We've got to kill 13 and a half men each. Maybe we'll just share the last one between us. I don't know. Well, that's getting a little bit harder, God. You know, it's, I don't really know if we want to do that. So, yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying, Gideon, but let's just make it a bit smaller. Huh? Just take them down to the water and let's make them drink. And he said, anybody who gets on the knees and puts a face in the water, tell them to go home. Anybody who just kind of puts it in the hand and laps with the mouth, that's, you know, we'll keep those ones. Oh, okay then, yeah, I suppose. And Gideon loses another 9,700 men. So that's 9,072. That's 300 men. Gideon's left with 300 men. I'm wondering if those 300 wished they'd been part of the first 22,000. Now the odds, see if your brain's working overtime, 450 to 1. So every man in Gideon's army has to kill 450 other men. Hmm. I don't like those odds. They're not good. <laughs> But the thing that, about this is that God is saying to Gideon, this is not about you. This is not about you. This has never been about you. It's not even about Israel. It's about me. And wherever you are in life right now, whatever you're facing, whatever your past looks like, whatever you have been through, and whatever you look like you might be facing, God is saying, this is not about you. This is about me. This is about my greatness and my glory and what I can accomplish you know, where are you at this morning? Gideon was hiding in his wine press. Where are you? What are you skeptical about? Are you broken? Are you lacking faith? Are you that Mr. and Mrs. Nobody that Gideon thinks he is? I'm the least in my family, the least out of everybody. Wondering what life is all about. Wondering, can I do this? Well, I'm going to answer that question for you. No, you can't. You can't do this. 
You've never been able to do this because God never designed you and made you and created you to be able to do this yourself. He created you for relationship with him. He created you for a purpose, but a purpose that is directly connected to him and is not able to be accomplished without him. This tiny little scratch that we get on the line of eternity is nothing if it is not invested in the purposes of God. If it's not absolutely rooted in who God is and filled with his power to be able to do it. To do it. 